Tragic Medusa Medusa is often fabled as the vile monster slain by the demigod Perseus, but legend shows an almost paradoxical and little known beginning to the horror she becomes. Medusa was the daughter of the sea gods Phorcus and Ceto, and sister to Sitheno and Uriel, all immortal except for her. Legends speak of Medusa's luscious golden locks and how, combined with her beauty and charm, enchanted men from far and wide. Mobs of admirers sought to partner with her, but she instead chose a life in service to Athena, a child of Zeus and goddess of wisdom and war. The virgin Medusa became Athena's high priestess, a role that required celibacy. But a god, and an Olympian at that, robbed her of it. Poseidon, god of the oceans and brother to Zeus, yearned for Medusa. But she spurned his advances. Enraged at being rejected, Poseidon eventually forced himself upon her in Athena's shrine. The goddess of wisdom appeared not long after, but did not take action against Poseidon, nay, she saw fit to lay her wrath upon Medusa, transforming her into a serpentine monster, complete with locks of wild, venomous snakes. Perhaps the cruelest part of Athena's punishment was that Medusa retained her beautiful face, yet her gaze would now petrify all men who caught it. For a time, many tried but failed to slay the beast she had become, all except one. Perseus, Gorgon Bane The task of slaying Medusa fell to the demigod Perseus, a son of Zeus and a man of tragic yet humble beginnings. As a newborn, Perseus was left for dead with his mother Danae by the Argonian throne. Yet, as the fates would have it, a fisherman from the island of Seraphos happened upon them. The kind-hearted Dictes took them in and raised Perseus as his son on Seraphos. Years later, Perseus would find his fate tied to Medusa when the sly king of Seraphos sought his mother's hand. Perseus would not allow it, and so the king dreamt up an impossible task for the demigod. He demanded a Gorgon's head as tribute. The gods aided Perseus in this matter. Hades, the god of the underworld, gifted him a helm of darkness. Hermes outfitted him with flying boots, and Zeus gave him a sword. But most importantly, Athena bequeathed a mirrored shield. With his divine tools in hand, Perseus was set. His destination? Medusa's lair, a place where no man had returned from. But Perseus, a son of Zeus, was no mere mortal man. He slipped into the hollow where Medusa was at rest with her Gorgon kin. Therefore, he evaded petrification and crept to her by way of her reflection on the shield and hacked off his king's boo. From her ashes rose Pegasus, a flying steed on which Perseus fled from the now woke and raging Gorgons. And with that, Medusa, the once pure holy woman of Athena, transformed into a monster through no fault of her own, was no more. From this single deed, Perseus, the bane of the Gorgons, would rise to kinghood and legend. Tales of his adventures would echo down through the ages and be made grander throughout each generation. Yet it was his lineage that would spawn another legend of Herculean proportions, and from that, perhaps the fiercest, mightiest warriors Europa has ever known. Heracles, Father Sparta Legend speaks of Heracles, the son of Zeus, the strongest Olympian. He, 
and his one dozen impossible labors. But this is not that story. No, what follows is what some call his 13th labor. This is the tale of how he sired the sons of Sparta. By request of the king of Thespius, Heracles was to hunt, track, and end a rabbit beast. The massive lion of Kitheron was butchering the kingdom's cattle. Eager to prove himself, the young Heracles took the quest without hesitation. But there was likely another motive to the demigod's eagerness. You see, the king of Thespius promised Heracles quite a boon, the chance to bed his 50 daughters. The trouble was, Heracles was without arms. Even with all his might, he dared not face such a beast in unarmed combat. So, the son of Zeus uprooted a massive olive tree atop Mount Helicon and used it to craft his famous wooden club. The hunt was on. For 50 days and for 50 nights, Heracles tracked the Lion of Kitheron throughout the Thespian lands, each night returning to rest in the king's royal palace. But he did eventually come face to face with the beast and its giant head of death. He met his foe with club in hand and battered the lion's head inside out. Afterward, he flayed it and dragged himself in its fur. Heracles accepted his reward with vigor, laying with the 50 daughters of the king in one night. His actions throughout the twilight bore him 52 sons, some of whom would, according to legend, go on to become Sparta's legendary warrior kings. Leonidas, Herculean Sacrifice Legend speaks of the Spartan warrior King Leonidas, a real man of historical record who remains mythic even to this day. This is the tale of how he and 300 Spartans sacrificed themselves in a battle that inspired all of Greece to action. Leonidas has seen many battles, but none like what was to come. One million soldiers, led by the Persian leader Xerxes, brought war upon the Spartan homeland. The king asked the oracle at Delphi if Sparta should fight. She told him two outcomes, his death or Sparta's demise. Aged 60, the king had lived longer than the men of his time and had seen his share of war. But even Leonidas, with all his knowledge of Spartan tactics, had seen nothing like the Persian behemoth at its door. Such a force was a challenge no Spartan could ignore. Along with 4,000 other Greeks, Leonidas took 300 of Sparta's finest to wage war on Persia at Thermopylae. The aim? Defend the pass and let no enemy combatant past. And their plan worked for a time. Thermopylae was critical for Xerxes to secure. Doing so would provide access to the rest of Greece. Yet, due to its narrow nature, Persia's numbers did not matter as the area could only hold several hundred men at a time. For 72 hours, Leonidas and his forces held the pass, butchering thousands of Persian soldiers. They felt like they could go on forever, but the oracle's prediction would soon ring true after a traitor showed the Persians how to overwhelm the Spartans' rear defenses. And so, King Leonidas and a few hundred others made their last stand against the Persians before being obliterated into the pits of Tartarus. The prophecy said either Sparta would fall or their king would. Leonidas decided it would be the latter. The story of Leonidas and many others was relayed by the Greek historian Herodotus, 
more commonly known as the father of history. But legend calls this writer another name, the father of lies. Herodotus, Alpha Historia. Legend speaks of Herodotus. Some call him the father of history. Others call him the father of lies. The tomes put him somewhere in Persian-ruled Greece, but other than whispers of exile and wealth, little is known about how this writer lived. What most agree on was that Herodotus was the original historian. He, unlike other ancient scribes, viewed his work through the prism of inquiry. Herodotus took events as cause and effect, whilst others penned epics. Herodotus crafted one single work, the histories. These writings are considered the founding record of Western history. Today, they're nine books long. Yet a man of inquiry in an age of imagination proved controversial. In modern times, the histories are looked upon as critical to the understandings of his era. So what made the methods of Herodotus so very unique? Herodotus traveled across land and sea, gathering recollections of reality and myth, of rumors and gossip, of events and battles untold. He assembled all of his records into a historical narrative, weighted with his own reasoned analysis of the time he lived in. But this ancient scribe's inquiries did not sit with the narrative that Athens was the promised land. You see, Herodotus brought tales from foreign lands, tales that cracked the aura of wonder surrounding the enlightened Greeks. Most famously, the histories chronicled one of the first major clashes of East and West between the Persians and the Greeks, often favoring the latter. Yet despite its many flaws and its patchwork nature, without the histories, history itself would not be as we know it. Indeed, dear friends, if it were not for Herodotus, this tale would not be told. The Roman scribe Cicero dubbed Herodotus the father of history, but to this day, the father of lies title still follows his legend. Though his methods were much less divisive than other thinkers of the time, specifically much less so than a barefooted philosopher who questioned everything. Socrates, Pater Philosophia. Legend speaks of Socrates, a man fundamental to Western critical thought and logic. But unlike Herodotus, this philosopher made no writings. Socrates only spoke and drank. Born the son of a mason and midwife, Socrates for a time followed in his father's footsteps as a man of the stone. As was Greek law, he became a soldier and battled in several Athenian campaigns against the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War. Socrates eventually became a husband and later a father to three sons, but it is said that he cared little for his family. His true desire was to cultivate the minds of young Athenians. As a teacher, he played the barefooted fool with his debative students, telling them, I don't know anything. I'm just trying to understand what it is you are saying. Round and round this would go, with each Socratic reply uncovering deeper ideas and meaning. Socrates was no fool, for it was through this method that he struck at the core of some of life's most fundamental questions. Nothing was off limits, even the gods. Yet, as with many philosophers, his inquisitive nature was not very popular. Socrates found himself on trial for blaspheming the Greek pantheon and corrupting the minds of the youth. 500 citizens of Athens took part in the trial of Socrates, a trial that saw him sentenced to death by hemlock poisoning. Friends, allies, and others urged Socrates to escape Athens, but a coward he was not. Socrates accepted the punishment and gulped it down. 
He died for his principles, and his teachings inspired many young Athenians, including a writer named Plato, who later wrote of him as legend. But he was not the only man of ethics in his time. There was another, another whose oath would shape the very well-being of the billions of souls yet to be born. Hippocrates, Dr. Medicine. Legend speaks of Hippocrates, the father of medicine and champion of science. His namesake can be found in the Hippocratic Oath, a vow taken by healers even to this day. A descendant of Heraclean lineage, Hippocrates was born into wealth on the island of Kos. He was educated in the ways of healing by his father, a physician, and also worked with him as his apprentice. Indeed, Hippocrates rose to become a stellar practitioner of his chosen trade, healing many of the sick and wounded he came across, including the king of Macedonia. But it was an awful sickness that was to test his medicinal mettle, a contagion in the Greek capital. Following a Spartan invasion, Athens was sick with the plague. On investigation, Hippocrates noted that iron workers were unaffected and deduced the arid nature of the climate in which they worked shielded them against the plague. With this in mind, Hippocrates diagnosed the illness and made a simple yet macabre prescription for all Athenians. He instructed that all cadavers and clothing of the infected were to be scorched that drinking water was to be boiled, and each home was to house fire as to recreate the dry atmosphere of an ironworks. And not long after, all traces of the plague had vanished. Athens was cured, thanks to Hippocrates and his eye for symptoms. From this deed and others, his renown would rise beyond Greece to Persia, where the king of Persia requested his aid in curing the plague. Hippocrates, according to legend, declined. But he was not just a healer, like his father before him. Hippocrates was also a teacher and a scholar. He created a school of medicine on Kos, where he taught many students in the ways of medicine, usually under the shade of a grand sycamore tree. Hippocrates was a hero of Athens, with a legacy intact even in modern times. Yet there are others, others who are more myth than man and deal in monsters and in magic. Odysseus, nobody's Cyclops. Legends speak of a Cyclops called Polyphemus and how this giant lost something very dear to the Greek warrior king, Odysseus. Polyphemus lived on an island with others of his kind. It was there that Odysseus and his men found themselves marooned on return from the Trojan War. They came upon a cave stocked with food, but it was a ruse. Polyphemus trapped them. See, dim-witted as he may be, Polyphemus was more cunning than most cyclopes. He was the son of the ocean god Poseidon, after all. Legends say that the Cyclops devoured many of Odysseus' men, so he hatched an escape plan. One night, Odysseus set about befriending the giant and plied Polyphemus with strong wine. The merry Cyclops asked Odysseus his name. He replied, nobody. The giant soon fell into a drunken stupor, but Odysseus was not finished with his one-eyed captor just yet. He had crafted a wooden stake, and with both hands, Odysseus drove it down through the giant's eye. Polyphemus awoke, screaming in pain, yelling, NOBODY HURT ME! The other Cyclops heard his calls, but ignored him, thinking that nobody had indeed hurt him. However, Odysseus and his surviving men were not out of danger just yet. Just because Polyphemus was blinded, didn't mean he could do no damage to the Greeks. Later, Polyphemus went out of the cave with his flock of sheep. He checked their backs to see if any of his captors were there. He found none, 
where Odysseus and his men were tied to the bellies of the sheep. Having now escaped, the Greeks continued their journey. But their victory came at a cost. Poseidon cursed Odysseus's voyage for his actions against his son that day, setting him and his men adrift and unable to return home for years. Though they were not the only ones to feel the vengeance of the ocean god, there was another, and that is perhaps one of the most famous Greek myths of all. Theseus vs Minotaur – The Cursed Quest Legend speaks of the Minotaur, the dreaded man-bull of Crete. He and his unrelenting foe, the Greek hero Theseus. Cursed from birth by the ocean god Poseidon, the young calf boy was born to the queen of Minos. She raised the youngling and loved him only as a mother can. Yet, as he grew, he became savage, monstrous, and wild. The king of Minos sought counsel from the future seer, the oracle at Delphi. She told of a future of doom and woe, ultimately advising on the construction of a labyrinthian maze in which to place his rabid stepson. This was where the carboy grew to man-bull. Half human, half bull. The tomes tell of the beast's confused diet. He ate not the plants from the ground, nor the meat of animals, but the flesh and bone of man. The king satiated the Minotaur's bloodthirst. As recompense for the death of his son by the Athenians, Athens afforded him seven younglings and seven maidens every nine years. All were set loose a sacrifice in the Minotaur's lair. When the third round came, the Athenian prince Theseus stepped up to best the monster. His bravery attracted the hand of the king's daughter, Ariadne. If he slew the Minotaur, he would raise a white sail on his return to Athens as a signal to his father King Aegeus, ruler of Athens, that he was successful. With the help of Ariadne, Theseus bested both labyrinth and beast. Yet on his return journey, he forgot the white sail, raising a black one instead. Taking this as a sign of his beloved son's demise, Aegeus threw himself from a cliff. Theseus was now king of all Athenians. The dreaded beast, the Minotaur, born from Poseidon's curse, was no more. The Athenians told many stories of myth and legend, but none ring true today like the tale of their grand leader Pericles and his non-Greek wife Aspasia. Aspasia and Pericles, Athenian Embrace Legend speaks of Pericles, the leader of Athens and his wife, Aspasia. Ancient scribes tell of both, but Aspasia is remembered both in favor and in disdain. They call her a scoundrel, intellectual, a harlot, a luminary. Whatever Aspasia was, she was extraordinary. It is the golden age of Athens, and the city flourishes under Pericles, but not all is well for Athens' first citizen. He has split from his first wife for a foreigner, known as a metic then, and this new union has caused scandal throughout Athens. Despite being a non-Athenian and a female one to boot, Aspasia wielded much influence among the Athens elite. This may have been due to her station as the betrothed of the ruler of Athens, but it was how she utilized her charge that raised eyebrows. Many say Aspasia was educated and wished to engage in a knowledge exchange with others. This, some say, led to her establishing a place of learning for the daughters of Athenian high society. There she is said to have taught and lectured with a passion. But it was not just women who were educated by Aspasia, no. Some of the most influential ancient Greek men are believed to have learned from her, including her Pericles and the father of philosophy himself. Socrates is said to have admired her eloquence and studied elocution under her. 
Some credit Aspasia with authoring her husband's most famous speech, the Funeral Oration. This was a grand tribute to warriors who had died fighting for Athens. Opponents of Pericles used Aspasia and her outsider status against him. Even Pericles' own family are said to have slandered her for political favor. But no matter. Pericles' love for Aspasia withstood many ordeals and was even put to trial. Over a thousand jurors are said to have judged whether Aspasia's conduct amounted to sacrilege against the gods. Legend says it was Pericles and a powerful yet tearful speech of his love for her that got the impiety charges dropped. They lived happily for a time and even sired a son. Pericles the younger bore his father's namesake and grew to be a military general. He was even granted Athenian citizenship, a very rare thing for the son of Metix. But when Athens fell to the plague, so did Pericles. Aspasia loved another, but in time, he too also passed. Death, it seems, is a mathematical certainty for us mortals in the geometry of life. Pythagoras of Monks and Math Legend speaks of Pythagoras, an ancient Greek mathematician of both scholarly and religious renown. He and his brotherhood of monks devout in their study of arithmetic. Pythagoras began life among family on the island of Samos, where he received a most fine education. It is said he traveled far and wide while young, soaking in the wisdom of foreign lands both near and far. As Pythagoras grew older, he became a mathematical sage. Many traveled to hear the wisdom of this most learned man. Yet, Pythagoras was discontented with the tyrannical ruler of his homeland and left to establish something he could call his own. His beliefs are rooted in the idea that numbers represent all in the real world. For him, pure data was the be-all and the end-all. Others too followed him in this understanding. They were called the Mathematikoi, devout Pythagorean followers. With their master, they gathered in Crotone, southern Italy, to study in the way of numbers and math. There, it is said Pythagoras discovered his theorem, that the area of a square on the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the area of squares on the triangle's other sides. Many debate the nature of his discoveries, often suggesting that they were the work of his followers and not Pythagoras himself. Yet, whether fable or fact, one thing is undeniable. The impact on Pythagoras on math was profound. His work is still used even to this day, but he, a man of myth and legend, came from a time of myth, tragedy, and epic and divine conflicts. In Love and War, the Sons of Ares Terror, Fear, War, Deimos, Phobos, and Ares, the terrible three, the bringers of destruction, fiends and villains all, the most savage gods of war. But where did it all begin for this trifecta of death? Well, like most tales, it began with a man and a woman, but this was no mortal romance, nay, these two were born of the Olympian flame. Ares, the war god and brother to Zeus, was in love. He had fallen for Aphrodite, the goddess of love and wife of Hephaestus, the blacksmith god. But wedlock mattered to them not, and very soon their desire rocked Olympus itself. From that act, Ares bore himself twin sons, Deimos, the god of terror, and Phobos, the god of fear. Together, the three would reign conflict and warfare across all of Greece and beyond. Riding alongside them was their Ares four custodians of war. They were known as trembling, fear, dread, and panic. 
Also on this side was the goddess Enyo, sister of Ares and kin of war. But none were more terrifying than that of Deimos, the relentless harbinger of sheer terror. No peasant, man or king could escape his reach. Everyone was a victim of Deimos. Despite his mythic status, both he and Phobos featured little in the tales of ancient Greece, but he remains iconic even through to modern times.